All right, so uh, today we now move from the Excel type experiments that we've been doing into a, a tool that's actually meant specifically for system dynamics modeling. So whereas Excel is a general purpose tool that we can do numerical simulations in if we kind of know the right formulas, um, those, I hope you've seen that those formulas, even for simple systems, are a little bit tedious to keep track of all of that, that bookkeeping. And so what we'd like to do is to sort of take something as nice as a diagram that um, really captures all of the important connections and then let a computer program generate the spreadsheet behind the scenes so that we don't have to, so that we can just kind of live at the diagram level. And that's what we're kind of getting into today. So picking up with where we left off, uh, so you did that assignment, assignment D2 on this toilet tank example. And then the toilet tank, we, uh, the back of a toilet tank kind of looks like this. This is sort of as it's filling. And we can keep track of a couple of things in a toilet tank as it's filling. We can keep track of its current water level, the top of this blue period here. And then it is target water level where it <clears throat> is designed to fill up to. And if we measure the difference between those, we get a tank gap, a gap that uh, represents the amount of work that still needs to be done before the toilet mechanisms uh, over here can shut off. And so if we were to draw a simple causal loop diagram like you did in uh, assignment D2, then you have something that looks like this negative feedback loop where if the water level gets higher, it will then reduce this tank gap. So that's why this is a reduction here. And then as the tank gap gets smaller, then it will um, end up reducing the, um, it'll, sorry, if the tank gap gets larger, so if that were to grow, then, um, then the, 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 the change in the water level uh, will end up being, so the, the so that, the trouble I'm having here is that this is sort of the general purpose diagram for, you know, like I said, filling up a bucket. And I've kind of got things kind of sort of flipped here in the way I've got them drawn here. But the idea here is that with the bigger the tank gap, the more water you put in the tank, the more water you put in the tank, then the smaller the tank gap. And that's what forms this balancing feedback loop. If you were to go in and change the target water level, so in most toilets, you can go in and you can actually say, I don't need as much water in the tank. And this is like a water saving thing, or I need more water in the tank. And so you can increase that water level, but it takes an exogenous process to do that. So somebody else has to go in and change that so that we're not modeling how this changes. We assume it's constant. But if someone were to change the target water level then and increase it, then it would make the tank gap increase as well. So that's kind of what we're trying to depict here. But when we actually think about how we simulate a toilet, then we have to ask, well, what determines the flow of water? So, um, so it, it seems like we were missing something here. And so the thing that we're missing is the actual flow that is going into the tank, which is set by a valve which uh, is sort of the, the left half of this tank here. So um, if I were to go back a slide, this cartoon drawing of a toilet tank here, all of this ugly stuff on the left here, well, some of it is filling up the toilet bowl. We can forget about that, but the rest of it is controlling the water that's actually going into the back of the tank. And, and so this here is a valve, which is paying attention to the tank gap. And then based on what the tank gap currently is, is changing the flow of water. And so the idea there is that we can put that valve directly into our causal loop diagram by inserting this flow of water here. So the idea here is if the tank gap gets larger, then the flow of water will get larger, which will increase the water level. And as the, as the water level increases, then it will reduce the gap. So that's the negative feedback here. So, um, so that is kind of the missing component. But once we have that, then now we can kind of see the real dynamics here. So we can see that logically there is a tank gap. It is being measured internally by a mechanism that then determines the flow of water. 
So now we know kind of the connection between tank gap and flow of water. And then that flow of water we know physically is going to change the water level, which then logically is going to reduce the tank gap. And that's how all of these things connect. So now that we have this idea that our causal loop diagram is somehow more complete, it has that extra detail, then it sets us up for the stock and flow diagram that is what we're, we're moving into now. And so the idea here is from a causal loop diagram like this one, I have a, a set of things that I would refer to as stocks, which we'll define formally here in a second. But basically, these are the memory in the system. So you can say at any instant of time, um, how do I characterize a toilet? Well, I characterize it by how much water is in the tank. So if I know that it's empty, then I know that it will soon start filling. So I know everything about the future of the toilet knowing that it is currently as an empty tank. If I know that it's full at 15 centimeters, then that tells me that uh, that, that is going to stay full and stay there at 15 centimeters until there's some shock to the system of flush. So that's another exogenous driver there. But it's, you know, without that happening, then the toilet is just gonna stay there at 15 centimeters. If I know it's somewhere in between, then I know it's been filling up to that point and it will continue to fill. So the water level tells me the state of the system. It tells me where the system currently is, where it's been and where it will go from here. So that is a stock. The state variables are these stocks. And then the things that cause those state variables to change over time are the flows. And so in this case, it is a literal flow of water. So that's our stock and our flow. And so we can look at a causal loop diagram and we can say this variable is a stock, this variable is a flow, and these other variables like the ones over here, they're not either of those, they're just kind of helpers. And we can then put those into a different diagrammatic format, which is this one over here. And this is the so-called stock and flow diagram, where all our stocks show up here as rectangles. This blue oval is just me trying to show that there's a connection between these two diagrams. And the flows show up as these thick arrows with these little valves on them, just like there's a valve in a toilet. These extra uh, things that help us do the connections just show up as circled variables, and we're going to call those converters, as we'll see here in a second. And then I can draw the same links. In a causal loop diagram, you always annotate the polarities of these links. In a stock and flow diagram, as we'll see, those polarities don't have to be annotated, but it sure sometimes is very helpful if, they, if they're annotated here. So these links just mean that the water level has some causal influence on the tank gap and the tank gap has some causal influence on the flow of water. But in a stock and flow diagram, I don't necessarily need to put the minus and the plus here. It just sort of helps with interpretation when I do. All right, so to drill down into this a little bit farther, um, as I mentioned, I'm gonna call uh, anything in this square box, a stock, that's again, the state of the system. Sometimes they're also called accumulators or levels or box variables. Um, any of these things in the circles here, I'm calling converters. They're also called auxiliary variables, dynamic variables, or parameters. And these are things which are, you don't necessarily need them. Like I could have connected water level directly to flow of water. And then the formula inside flow of water would be more complicated but I can simplify the formula inside flow of water if I've already calculated a tank gap outside here. I can just say the flow of water is related to the tank gap. I've sort of named another variable here, but this is just meant to be um, help a helper in the calculation. I could have just directly connected water level to flow of water and got rid of the tank gap entirely. But if I do that, if you think back to your causal loop diagram, it kind of takes important details out. So it is more informative to leave all those variables in. So then um, if I were to drill down into this stock and flow diagram, there is additional information that we tell VinSim after we draw this stock and flow diagram. So I, if I were to drill down into target water level, I can assign it a number, 15. If I were to drill down into tank I can assign it a formula, target water level minus water level. If I were to drill down into flow of water, this flow here, I can assign it a formula, in which case this formula is just a copy of whatever's in tank gap. So that ends up being the same sort of thing, how you put formulas into your spreadsheet. Now there's two other 
formulas that we care about here that are hidden from the diagram. And that's the initial water level. So in your spreadsheet, that's like the top of the spreadsheet. Um, and so if you were to drill down into a stock variable like water level, it gives me an opportunity to tell me the initial stock variable in this case was zero centimeters because I'm simulating right after a flush. And then I also have to go in and tell it the time step. And so in your spreadsheet, you needed a time step. In Vinson, you'll need a time step. And there'll be a separate place off the diagram that'll be like within the Vinson settings where you'll end up setting the time step. Just like there is a separate cell in your Excel spreadsheet where you set that time step. So this is where we're going. How that maps to where we've been, we can look at the spreadsheets that you built for assignment D2 and we started to talk about you know, in the last lecture for the toilet tank. And you have maybe a spreadsheet that looks like this one where <clears throat> you've got these parameters up here, DT, 0.01, target water level 15. They're out here. They're just these extra cells hanging out on the side. Those are types of converters. Then we've got our <clears throat> water level stock. Well, there is a column for the water level stock. And we've got our um, this um, tank gap converter. Well, there is a column for that tank gap converter. And just like this tank gap converter takes the target water level in, and it takes the water level in, and it calculates a number, then in our spreadsheet, we took the wa target water level in, the B2 there, and we subtracted the current water level, the B5, and we put that into a formula. And that was our tank gap formula. And so if we were to drill down into this in the VINSIM, we'd find a formula just like this one, but it'll use words and not cell identifiers. So then if I were to go over the flow of water, well, I said the flow of water is just the tank gap. Well, in our spreadsheet, the flow of water, we just set that equal to our tank gap column. And our tank gap column, and here it says 15 because it's been calculated, but behind the scenes, it's this formula, which is 15 minus the current water level. 15 minus zero is 15. So this will be, this flow of water will be whatever is in the D uh, column uh, in that row. And if we fill down, whatever's in the D column will just get copied over into the C column. And that is because we're just setting the flow of water equal to the tank gap directly. So then in our next row, we need to move time along. And in that case, we just say the previous time plus DT. And that's all we did in this formula here. And then in uh, the previous stock plus DT times the previous flow associated to that stock, that's the formula we did there. And that's what we do for the target water level. And these two things down here, these are, if you were gonna do a stock and flow diagram uh, of any system in an Excel spreadsheet, you would have these bottom two, they would look identical. The time would move along the same way and the stocks would move along the same way. What changes as you move from bacteria to toilet to population dynamics of a human population to whatever is the system specific formulas that are up here. So these kind of converters here. So there's a tank gap that exists for a toilet but doesn't exist for bacteria. In bacteria, there was an uh, average lifetime and an average uh, time until reproduction. Those exist for bacteria, but they don't exist for a toilet tank. So all of those differences show up effectively in how you write your flow formulas here and how they interrelate to each other. So after you've done that, um, you know, these things here, by the way, I guess I can pause for that. Are there questions about these formulas here? This is effectively the solution for assignment D2 where you built the uh, toilet tank. And I'll show you the output to that here in just a second. But before I go to the next slide, which will get rid of these formulas, I want to see, are there questions on these formulas? Do these make sense to you? Um, I, I have a question. Um, is there a way, sorry, I'm just like trying to like see the graphs in general. Do they go like from left to right and then to right? Like, like you see the graphs on the, like, the spreadsheets, which order are they in? Do the, the graphs from, um, I don't know what you mean by by do the graphs go from left to oh oh you mean from you mean in these like these four boxes that I put up here do they go from left yeah, to yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I mean I guess if I were to sort of say what order did I write these things in? <clears throat> um, they I they I would I guess I would go from top left to top right to bottom left to bottom right. 
but um, but I mean, all these formulas, like it, a spreadsheet doesn't ever work until you put all the formulas in. So it doesn't it really matter what order you put them in, but once they're all in there, then they all interrelate and fill out the spreadsheet. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions about this? Now, when I went through, um, uh, you know, I only got to look through about like 18 of the submissions for these, but like, aside from like a minor detail on one or two, about everybody got what uh, they, that everybody that I reviewed got the expected answer um, here, which was <clears throat> this <clears throat> blue line right here. This is the water level starting from zero, rising up asymptotically to 15. And it never quite gets to 15, but it gets so close to 15 that it might as well be at 15. And in physical reality, the toilet would shut off because it would um, kind of become close enough that the valve would enter into a region that is like unmodeled in the way that we've done it. But in the, the real valve would maybe shut off when it's sort of sufficiently close. And so, um, so that's what you get here, the water level rising up, getting closer and closer and closer to 15. And if you were to plot, I didn't ask you to, but if you were to plot, the flow of water coming in, it would match the tank gap. And so it would start at 15 and it would decay down to zero. And it sort of looks almost like a mirror image of this water level rising here. So they end up crossing about um, at this point right here. Um, and so <clears throat> this again is just the level in the toilet becoming closer and closer and closer to the desired level and the desired level would be when this tank gap this orange one goes down to zero does this plot make sense does this match what people's intuition was you're supposed to picture like water filling in a toilet as it gets closer to that uh final position and as it gets closer to that final position the water going into the toilet gets smaller and smaller less and less um just for further clarification um, for the assignment, we were supposed to do just the flow of water and the water level of, uh, with time, right? We weren't supposed to do the tank gap, or were we? Um, because I was just all, curious. <laughs> all I asked you for was this rising plot, which was the water level itself. The falling plot is the flow of water, which if you plotted, that's fine. I just didn't, I don't think I asked you to plot the flow of water. The flow of water is identical to the tank gap in this problem. We have engineered a valve inside the toilet so that it generates a flow of water that is identically related to the tank gap. And so if there is a five centimeter gap, then you'll get five centimeters per second of water coming into the tank. And so that's why these two columns uh, match. We are modeling that we went to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, and we grabbed a valve um, out of the toilet section and it had a speed set up so that there was a one-to-one -one map between the gap in the toilet and the gap coming in. And so that's why this orange line, you can think of simultaneously as either the tank gap or the flow of water because they're identical. But I didn't okay, ask you to you. plot these two columns, only this column. Okay, I was just I was just curious. Thank you so much for answering that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about this? All right, so this is kind of where we all are. So we all have generated plots like this, and we did it inside this spreadsheet. And hopefully, um, and I think it'll start making more sense, but hopefully as you were putting the formulas in, it started making a little bit of sense as to what these formulas were capturing. Um, so that we were modeling again, it's like you went to Lowe's and you picked out um, a valve that if you looked at the tech specs of the valve, it would say that based on the current water level difference, this is how much water we're gonna allow into the toilet. And that's what we were modeling. And if you bought such a valve, you would end up getting a toilet that rose at this rate. Now, this is one way we could have modeled this. We could have alternatively modeled this with this differential equation here, where we would say um, we create a variable called water level, or you could call it x, which would be our state variable. And you can say dx dt or d water level dt equals, and this is what we were saying. This is basically saying dx dt equals whatever the valve tells us. And the valve says there's a one-to-one -one map between the gap of water in the tank and the rate of change that I am going to enforce by pouring water into the tank. 
So this is saying the rate of change of the water level is equal to this difference. And this is enforced by a valve. Someone is engineered a valve to operate this way. And so by running that spreadsheet, we are basically saying, what if we installed a valve that was this way? What would happen to our water level over time? And we would say that, well, very quickly, like within five seconds, <clears throat> you would be nearly at um, you know, that that 15 centimeters. And so we did it in a spreadsheet. You could conceivably also do this mathematically. There are methods and we could go over those methods, but they're kind of outside of the scope of this class um, and kind of intentionally here. And that, but related to what you did in SOS 211, where I could give you an expression like this and you could do uh, an integration. You could integrate this expression here. You could solve this differential equation. And you would end up getting an expression that looks like this one, where it would say the water level at any time is equal to the target water level times this expression one minus e to the negative t. And, um, and so this is the solution, the mathematical, the analytical solution to this problem here. And if I were to plot this thing down here, it would give me exactly the blue line right here. And so we in our spreadsheet generated the blue line without having to go through the mathematical step. We just had to write the differential equation. We had to write the tank gap. We put that in our spreadsheet. And with our tiny, tiny little DT logic, as long as our DTs were tiny enough, we fill down that spreadsheet, it ends up generating a plot, which will match the actual solution to this differential equation if we were to go through the math, but we didn't do the math. That's the magic of it all. Are there questions about that? Is it clear what we did there? It's an example of the type of modeling we do in system dynamics model. We come up with expressions for rates of change and if we feel like it, we could use our mathematical expertise to try to solve them uh, manually, analytically. But uh, the other thing we can do is just load them into these computer simulations, but we are loading the differential equations. So we still have to know how to write the rates of, the, the, um, the rates of change. So we come up with formulas for the rates of change, kind of like Newton did. And then we let the computer unroll this. If Newton had a computer, I don't think we would have calculus. I don't think calculus would exist. Calculus was Newton's way of saying, I got these rates of change. How the heck do I get from rates of change to predicting where planets actually are? If we had computers before calculus somehow, we could predict where planets would be from the rates of change without going through the math. And I don't think Newton would have bothered making calculus at all. So it's just sort of a thought problem there. So how do we interpret these flow equations or how do we start building these flow equations to begin with? Well, um, I was saying for the, um, if you see a flow equation that looks like this one, a stock amount, so some stock quantity like bacteria divided by a time interval. So like bacteria per bacterial lifetime. So it has this unit, stock units, like number of bacteria, divided by time units, like seconds. When you see a flow formula that looks like this, you interpret this as saying that if this flow was turned on constantly over the entire time interval in the denominator here, then the stock would end up rising by whatever amount is in the numerator. So that's the way we interpret this ratio here is if this flow was constant for this time interval, this is how much would be added. Now, in reality, the flow won't be constant for that time interval. It'll only be constant for dt, a really, really tiny amount. And after that dt, the flow is going to change because the stock will end up changing. But over that tiny little dt, the flow will be constant there. If the, um, the stock happens to stay the same, and it just you know keeps staying the same, and then the flow keeps staying the same. Then this, the one, then what would happen is over time time interval, then the stock would increase by this stock amount. So when we see flow expressions that look like this, then that's how we interpret them. So again, going back to the bacterial example, I was saying that the birth rate of the bacteria, we wrote a flow expression, which was the number of bacteria. That's the numerator 
um, times one over W, where W was the average time you wait. That's where W is, comes from, wait. How the average time you wait until a reproduction event. And so we can interpret this here in with this rule over here. So if the number of bacteria didn't change, then how much bacteria, how much new bacteria would be produced by the current amount of bacteria over W time units? So that's kind of what we're saying here. So put another way, if we weighted the average time to reproduction, this is W, then each of the current number of bacteria, that's the numerator, would reproduce and there would be a doubling of the number of bacteria. There would be a whole number of bacteria, more bacteria. So that's the way we interpret this flow formula here is if somehow bacteria were reproducing but their offspring were not, then how many more bacteria would we get if we weighted W time units, well, you would get another bacteria, you know, another, um, however current, you double your current number of bacteria. If you had five bacteria, and this was a, um, and the W, so, so bacteria here would be five, and if W was two, then if you waited two seconds, you'd have 10 bacteria. Now, in reality, uh, they're in that, those little bits of bacteria that are being produced might start reproducing early. So you might have more than 10 units of bacteria if you actually weighted W. But in the hypothetical case that you could manage to prevent that reproduction, that is kind of what we're saying here. So this is the instantaneous production of bacteria. That is how we're interpreting that. So in general, population growth rate is going to be number of bacteria divided by average time to reproduction, bacteria per second. That is, um, you know, if we're trying to do growth rate things, that's what you need to sort of ask is, what is the average time to reproduce for any individual to reproduce? And then the population growth rate at any instant of time will be the number currently in the population divided by the average time each individual in the population takes to reproduce. That's how we crafted that flow equation. Now, similarly, if you want to do death, it's the same sort of dance. And so in that case, the idea here is that L is our denominator, which is the average lifetime. So the ex expression for the outflow is looks just like the inflow, but we have a different time unit here. And so this is all this is saying here is that if you have you start with number bacteria, so you start with the numerator, then the question is how many bacteria do you lose after waiting L time units? And what this expression is saying is that you're gonna lose all of the bacteria after waiting L time units. So this is giving you an idea of the instantaneous death rate of the bacteria. So every bacteria is dying at a rate of one over L, and there are number of bacteria, bacteria, and so the instantaneous rate that the whole population is dying is just the number of bacteria divided by L. So again, for these population problems, the birth rate will be, um, however, is currently in the population divided by the time until reproduction, and the death rate will be, however, is currently in the population divided by the average time each individual stays in the population. And so, um, so that is where we get, um, a, you know, these flow formulas that look like this when we're, when we're referencing populations. So we can combine those together for populations and the general guidelines that we have is we can measure the average time it takes for an individual to be added to the population. And the contribution of that individual will be one over that time. And then we multiply the number of individuals in the population by that one over time. And that gives us our inflow for the population. So any population is going to look just like this one. You have to ask yourself, on average, how long does it take for an individual to be added? And then you effectively divide the current number of individuals by that time. And that gives you an inflow expression. And you do a similar thing with the outflow expression. And that's where we got the bacterial net flow here. That uh, just came from these two um, exercises together. So that's how we formed the bacterial flow. Now, 
I want to do the same thing for interpreting these flows for the toilet tank example, but I want to stop here for questions. Are there any questions here about where these flow formulas come from in the bacterial case? Because just to emphasize, our job in this class is not to solve the differential equations. The computers do that for us. Our job in this class is to come up with the differential equations, or in other words, come up with the flow formulas. So we need to figure out how to build these flow formulas. And I'm, so I'm just trying to say for populations, this is general guidelines for how you can build inflow and outflows. Okay. All right, so let's revise, or revise that a little bit for the toilet tank example. So in the toilet tank example, again, flows um, generally take this form where it's gonna be some amount of stock divided by some time interval because the units for a flow always have to be these units. They always have to be stock units divided by time units. So for the toilet tank, it's not a population here. And so, but we still need a way to form a stock amount divided by a time interval. So the way we interpret the flow for the toilet tank is if the toilet tank was turned on, if the valve here was turned on and left at this flow rate, then it would take this time interval to add this much water to the toilet tank. So the um, so if for our particular case, for the tank gap here, we said the flow of water is equal to the tank gap. We were implicitly saying the flow of water is equal to tank gap divided by one. So we were saying that this valve will in one second um, fill all of the remaining tank gap. So if you start with a tank gap of 15, then the flow of water will be 15 divided by one which will mean at the flow rate, at the very beginning, right after you flush the toilet, the beginning of the simulation, that flow rate will be highest. And that flow rate will be so high that if it stays in that position, a constant for a whole second, then you will fill the entire 15 centimeter tank gap. Now in reality, that's not gonna happen because only that, you're only gonna leave that flow on for DT. And at the next DT, the tank gap's gonna be smaller, which means the flow is gonna be smaller, which means it's gonna turn down uh, the valve a little bit. So water will come in a little more slowly. But, um, you know, so this, so that's kind of the story that here is not actually what's gonna happen. The toilet is gonna take longer than one second to fill, but, when we, we need to model the instantaneous rate. And so the instantaneous rate represents kind of like if it were this rate for this time interval, then it would manage to add this much to the stock. So for tank gap over one, then at any instant of time, if you measure that tank gap, then we're saying that the instant of water coming in, at, the, at that instant, the flow rate of water coming into the toilet tank is fast enough that it could fill all the rest of the toilet in one second at that rate. It won't because at the next DT, it'll be a little slower, but at the current rate, at that instant of time, it will fill the rest of the toilet in one second. That is the way we're modeling this. If we wanna engineer a new valve, we could go into that and we could change the one second in the valve to 10 seconds or 20 seconds. So this sort of implies that there is some physical hardware inside the valve that is going to allow the, the designer of the valve to adjust the speed of the valve. But the way they would specify it at any instant of time is to say that however much water is left, it will, it will pour out a, a flow of water at that instant of time so that it will fill the rest of the tank in whatever this denominator is. For our case, it was one second, but maybe we go to Home Depot, pick up a different valve, and it's actually five seconds that this should go here. And then we would get a much slower uh, rate. So the basic um, takeaways here is for bucket light stocks, not population stocks, that either empty or fill and then stop, 
then the inflow rate is always going to be written as kind of a gap size, which will kind of be like the difference between the current state and the target. So that target might be zero if it's emptying, or that target might be some upper set point if it's filling. Um, and it'll be gap size divided by T, where T is, um, if you were to go out and measure an actual toilet, then this T would be the time it takes for the toilet to fill to this magical number of 63.21%. And so um, I can show you guys maybe later in the semester where this number comes from, but this is just one of these magical numbers in mathematics, a really important number in the mathematics that characterize systems. And so if you were to go into a toilet and measure where 63% of the target water level is, and then flush the toilet and get a stopwatch out and wait and you know start the stopwatch at the flush and then stop the stopwatch right when it hit that 63% mark, you would get a time and that time might be 12 seconds. That 12 is what you put into your simulation if you wanted your simulation to accurately reproduce the way your toilet tank is filling. So we put in one second which was probably um, a little fast. So it was probably a lot fast actually, but I didn't want to introduce the complication of this extra parameter on your assignment, which is why I just pretended like, you know, T was equal to one and, you know, and just washed it kind of like you put it, I brushed it under the rug, but now we're bringing it, we're lifting up the rug and we're showing you there is a denominator under that rug. And that denominator was one in your assignment, but it could be anything. And you can actually measure what that denominator could be by actually measuring real systems. So any system that decays to zero or rises up to some set point, you can figure out what is 63% of its rise or its fall. And you can figure out on average, how long does it take for that system to reach that 63%? And whatever that time is, that's what you put in the denominator of the flow formulas when you're modeling the flows for these types of filling or emptying systems. And this T, by the way, uh, we sometimes call a time constant of the system. So uh, a lot of times when you pick up a data sheet or you ask somebody, a systems theorist about a system, you'll say, what is the time constant of this system? And they'll say, oh, it has a 30 second time constant or it has a 30 year time constant. And that's just technical jargon to say that, uh, that it takes about 30 years for this system to reach 63% of its final value. And, uh, and so that's, that's where that term comes from, time constant. Now, again, for a toilet, a one second time constant probably is way too fast. If you flush a toilet, it probably doesn't reach 63% at one second. It probably takes, I don't know, 10 seconds to do that. Uh, but uh, the flow is going to get slower and slower and slower. So the point is, is it's not is is the flow doesn't it, it doesn't rise uh, immediately to 15 and stop. It keeps rising slower and slower and slower and slower. And that slow decaying rate, that's what we're measuring that 63% of. All right. So are there questions about that? about these toilet tank formulas, about where we get the flow formula. Because remember, the flow formula for our toilet was tank gap divided by one. And, um, and so if we wanted to model a different toilet, it might be tank gap divided by 10. You know? But, um, but that's, this is the, the structure of the formula stays the same, where it's the amount left over to fill divided by the time constant. So any questions about that? Is that Kind of clear. That makes All sense. Right. Um, I also Thanks. was curious real quick um, for, you said it was 63.21 and that's like the very important number. Um, is that just like, where does that number like come from? Like, how did they figure that out? I'm not sure. I can't remember if you already said it, but I'm sorry if you did. <laughs> No, no, I, I didn't. I say I, I think we'll we'll when we um we'll have a lecture on delays and how to make um, model delays more explicitly after the midterm. So that's a more advanced topic that we'll get into. And I think I take some time there to talk about where the time constant comes from. But 
Um, but basically it has to do with um, the exponential. So if, um, <clears throat> so if you take the um, e to the negative one, Mm -hmm. Then, uh, and if I, I'll just can just put this in the chat. So um, the you know Euler's number, you know e. Uh, if you raise it to the negative one, so basically if I do one over e, yeah, so one divided by e is going to be equal to um, thirty-seven percent. Basically, one minus this zero point six three two one. So this oh, okay. sixty-three point two percent is just like one minus one over e. And this Euler's number ends up being really important in differential equations. And that's why it comes up. It's just a okay. fancy number. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Or put another way, if <clears throat> basically once upon a time, people realized it was convenient to write flow equations for these types of systems in this form, gap divided by constant. And they said, well, where the heck does this time constant come from? Well, then they solved the differential equation that results from writing a flow formula this way. And they said, aha, if the, whatever is in the denominator here will be the, um, the time at which the system reaches one minus one over E of its final trajectory. And so that's, um, that's where it came from. So um, I, I don't want to make it sound like it started with 63.21%. And then that is what caused them to write formulas this way. It actually started with people writing formulas this way because these formulas made sense and they were convenient. And then asking, what does the denominator mean physically? And then when you end up solving that, then you end up getting the 63.21% out. And then it just happens to have a nice convenient application that you can go in to the real world. And whenever you get things that are rising or falling, you can measure how long it takes them to hit 63.21%. And then you can write that down as a feature of the system. And then you can put that in a catalog somewhere. And whenever you want to simulate something, you just need to look in that catalog what the time constant is. And so long as you have the right time constant, you can simulate the right dynamics without having to remodel the whole system. All right, any other questions? All right, so let's do a real quick attendance uh, exercise. Um, and uh, the question here um, is just relating to that past uh, discussion there is what is the term and it's two words that we use for the 63.21% time? So I said there's a word or there's a term, a phrase that's two words long and, uh, and it is what we refer to as the time at which a system reaches 63.21% of, um, of its final value. So what is that term? All right. And I'll put the, uh, I'm sorry, I'll put the um, URL in the chat as well to be more convenient. <clears throat> okay. All right. So those are the examples we've done already, the bacteria in the toilet tank. Let's get a little more generic and start talking about stock and flow diagrams. And, um, and, uh, and by the way, the term I was looking for was time constant there. So, um, you know, if, if you didn't get it, that, that's fine. You know, again, these are graded for completion, not correctness. And I'm actually very interested in seeing how people are doing. So I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what your first answer was but i um, also happy to tell you that that's what I'm looking for. And that's a term that you should be happy to use. The time constant of a system and kind of how slow a system is. All right, so um, stock and flow diagrams, more generally, not just uh, for this toilet tank and bacterial case. So stocks are going to be depicted in different programs in slightly different ways, but I hope you can see the similarities. In VinSim, this is the way stocks look. Uh, there is a program called AnyLogic, which makes stocks that look like this. There's a program called Stella, or the actually the program that your textbook uses. Uh, stocks look like this one. And then there is InsightMaker, stocks look like this one. So they all kind of look like boxes. That's 
the key point here. And they all represent things that accumulate over time. So they represent the current state of a system, how much water is in a bucket or how much water is in a toilet, how much money is in a bank. So if you know how much money is in a bank, you know how much interest will be calculated the next year and you can figure out how much money will be in the bank the next year. So if you just knew the interest rate, uh, you'd know how much money potentially could grow, but you won't actually be able to know anything about the bank account without knowing how much money's in the bank. So that's what we mean by a state variable. It is the thing you need to actually be able to make predictions quantitatively about where the system's gonna be in the future. That's the state of the system. And with the state of the system, you can calculate other things like the flows. So with the number of uh, dollars in the bank, I can calculate how much interest is generated and so on. So then that brings me to the next thing, which are flows. So flows are the things causing stocks to change. This is what they look like in Vinsim. This is what they look like in any logic. This is what they look like in Stella or your textbook. And this was what they look like in Insight Maker. They're kind of disappointing in Insight Maker. They're just kind of this big thick arrow without the fancy valve. Um, but um, you know, basically the key feature here is a thick arrow, almost always one that has a valve that either looks like this from the kind of like old school fluid dynamics text or one that kind of looks like this one. And this is meant to kind of look like a spigot, uh, you know, like this here, like on the outside of your house. So that's kind of what it's trying to show here. And so these uh, flows, um, they are representing that the stock either connected to the left of them or the right of them or both is changing by this rate. If the stock is connected on the right-hand side here near the arrowhead, then the flow is going in, which means it makes a positive influence on the stock. If the stock is connected on this hand side, then the flow is coming out, which means it has a negative influence of that, on that stock. But in both cases, it's causing a rate of change, either a positive rate of change or a negative rate of change of the stock. The other uh, diagrammatic thing you'll see are converters, which are just helpers. And so in uh, this is what they look like in VinSim, this is what they look like in any, any logic. Um, this is what they look like in Stella. And, um, and then this is what they look like in Insight Maker. You'll also see um, additional converters like the ones down here that have um, graphs built into them. And so we've already seen in the fisheries example where there was a converter, which was not a mathematical formula. It was a graph which converted the fish density to the regeneration rate. And so instead of specifying a formula for that, it was just drawn out. And so that is a special type of converter, which sometimes is just hidden like under a normal converter, but in some software programs like Stella and, and um, in any logic, then they actually do things like put a little squiggle in front of them. So that it makes it more clear that it is not a formula under there, that it is actually a table of values or a graph of values. So these are not technically needed to make your simulation go, but they clean up your diagram by sort of breaking up formulas into components so that you can bring those components together into formulas that make more sense. The other thing that we see are the connections between all of these things, and those are the links. And so these represent the, um, the causal relationships. And so this represents that something on the arrowhead side of the link needs something from the tail side of the link in order to do that calculation. In other words, if there's a change on the tail side of the link, it causes a change on the arrowhead side of the link. So they represent causal links. Um, sometimes they're referred to as informational links. Um, the textbook sometimes talks about the two of these, but doesn't really make a distinction of you know why there's a different name between here. I'm not gonna uh, worry too much about the difference between causal link and informational link. It's just meant to, to transmit information or transit causality from one point to another. These are definitely related to the links in your causal loop diagrams. You can label them with pluses and minuses, and that often is a great idea of something to do, but I'm not going to require it in your stock and flow diagram. Stock and flow diagrams just really need to show where the causal links are, but they're not meant to also show the exactly the types of feedbacks. 
um, they're just meant to show that one thing depends on another thing. But if you can show the polarities of these links right on the diagram, it often improves your diagram. So consider doing so. All right, so as examples, here are three dynamic variables. And so these are all used within a model of a bank. I have a desired bank balance here, and I have all bank balances here, and I have a gap between desired and actual. So um, the if I were to try to build this in VinSim, in order for me to calculate the gap between my desired bank balance and my current bank balance, I need access to both of these variables down here in this variable up here, in this formula up here. But there are no links. So if I were to try to simulate this, VinSim would complain that there would be an illegal formula implemented in this gap here because I have not given access to this variable or to this variable. I have not given desired bank balance to the variable, nor all bank balances to the variable. So to fix that error, I have to in VinSim draw this link and draw this link. And after I've drawn those links, then I can go into this variable and implement a formula that makes use of this variable and this variable in its formula. And VinSim will be happy with that. So thinking of that, like if I look at this diagram here, um, then um, just to move things along, I might not pause. Uh, I was originally gonna pause and ask people to think about this, but this is a stock and flow diagram where I've got my desired bank balance, all my bank balances in that gap up here, but I've also added in these two stocks, this stock keeping track of my savings account, this stock keeping track of my checking account. My savings account is, um, is affected by the interest coming into it. My checking account is affected by my salary. Now there are links that are clearly missing here that I need in order to make this thing work. And um, I would claim that the minimal set of links that are missing are these three links I'm about to draw here. These links are needed because I can't calculate an interest rate without knowing how much is in, or and not an interest rate. I can't calculate an amount of interest without knowing how much is currently in the savings account. So I need this link feeding back over here. I also can't calculate how much is in all of my bank balances without knowing how much is in both bank balances. So in order to even get started, I need those links just to make those formulas go. Are there questions about that? The fact to see how I, I had to add at least those three links. Here it is broken, here it is fixed. I had to add these three links. That makes sense. Now, as you stare at that, I'm hoping you you think that there's probably other links that a good model would also include. <clears throat> For example, um, right now there is no way to get money into the savings account except through interest. So there is probably needs to be an additional inflow or an adjustment of this inflow to account for maybe some fraction of my salary that goes automatically into savings. So I could draw a second inflow going into the savings account balance that would have a fraction of my salary. So I could put the, change this salary to like 75% of my salary and maybe 25% of my salary or 10% of my salary would end up going into savings and the other 90% would go into checking. So that would probably make this model more realistic. Um, and you could probably come up with other things. Like for example, um, the bank might change its interest. I see the hand, I'll get that in a second. Um, the bank might um, change its interest rate based on your balance based on either your savings account balance or all of your balances. So maybe there could be an additional link going from all balances back into the interest because I need to know how much is in all of your balances to give you the right interest rate. Because maybe if you have more money in the bank, you get a better interest rate um, as an example. All right, there's a question I think from Morgan. Yeah, when you said inflow, you're adding an inflow to, for like from the, I think it was the, 
amount of your salary into the savings account, would that just be a link going or you said you would add an inflow? So, or is, is that the like little arrow with the dark filled in arrow? Like you would add one of those. That, that would be an, one of those dark ones like this, this, this big one here. So the, the thick one, which um, I would draw in, in my uh, PowerPoint, but for some reason, my, my, uh, my PowerPoint right click isn't, it's like something else has got focus right now. So I can't draw it in, but, um, or maybe I'll do it this way if I, it'll let me. Yeah, right. Uh, so if I were to draw like a thick arrow, let me see if I can change the one second. So I would need to draw like a thick, another thick arrow that I know this, this is going to make the point here but another thick arrow with a valve that um, is coming in to the savings account sort of separately. Okay, so yeah, looking that just sense. like this interest. Okay. Thank you. And then it itself might have other thin links coming into it. Okay. All right. Okay, so questions. All right, well, let's, um, I wanna get to actually how to draw these things in, um, in VinSim here. So um, I'm gonna go kind of quick through here. I've already mentioned this, that um, inflows, this thick arrow, they have a positive influence on the stock. Consequently, there is always an implicit um, arrow that's kind of a thin arrow going this way from the inflow into the stock. We almost never draw this arrow explicitly. You just have to remember that it's there that there's always a positive influence from the inflow into the stock. Likewise, when you draw outflows, there is always a arrow pointing back at the stock with a negative uh, arrow here, a negative causal link. We hardly ever draw these explicitly, but those arrows are there. So when you look at a stock with an inflow and an outflow coming in and out of it, then you should in your mind see these arrows, these causal links going back from the outflow and forward from the inflow, the inflow one being positive and the outflow one being negative. And you need to remember that they're there because if you then add real arrows, then those end up forming loops. So for example, uh, if this stock has a true causal link going back from stock into the inflow, you have to keep in mind that there is an implicit positive arrow that is, um, and I think I've got my pointer back. There is an implicit positive arrow going from the inflow back into the stock. And likewise, there is an implicit backward negative arrow going from the outflow back in to the stock. So over here, you end up getting a balancing loop because you have a one negative link and a positive link in a loop together. Here, you end up getting a reinforcing loop because you've got one negative link and another negative link. So those two negative links here end up causing this to be a reinforcing loop. People often don't, I mean, this one over here is usually easier for people to, to see, this one on the left. This one on the right, people often forget about. And so they forget that this here forms a loop. There actually is a reinforcing loop here because there is an implicit negative arrow going back from the outflow into the stock because outflows decrease stocks they're connected to. So um, if I was to look at this bacterial diagram here, uh, which was exactly your bacterial case that, that you've done, I first go through and I annotate my links with their polarities based on the formulas here. Um, so I know that average lifetime um, L, um, I know the formula inside here is death rate, which is one over L. And I know that if um, due to the, because this is a fraction, if you increase L, you'll decrease one over L. And that's why there is a negative here. Death rate goes into deaths. Well, I know that the death rate here is um, the formula for deaths is just going to be number of bacteria times the death rate. So I'll say times dr for death rate. And so there I can see that if the death rate goes up, the number of deaths is gonna go up. And that's why this has got a positive there. And so I can go through and I can create all of these, um, these negative and positive annotations. 
And then I have to then add in the implicit one. So in my mind, I have to remember that there is a positive link going forward and a negative link going backward. And then that allows me to annotate those so that I can see that I have a reinforcing loop over here and a balancing loop over here. And then I can drop the implicit arrows because people that are familiar with stock and flow diagrams don't draw them, and, but I can leave everything else in. And this makes it clear, not only the dynamics of the system because I've got my stocks and flows made explicit, but it also makes the feedback loops so that I can start thinking about my patterns of loops from that, um, those system archetypes. And I can see that, aha, this has got S-shaped growth. So questions about that, does that make sense? Does everybody see where these annotations come from, how they relate to the formulas, and, um, and where these loops come from, the fact that there is a hidden loop going back and a, or a hidden link going back and a hidden link going forward. I do have a question. Um, why on the stock and flow diagram, why are the arrows coming out of the stock in that direction and not the opposite? For example, okay, so bacteria. Yeah, so uh, a great question. So that if I were to go inside the deaths valve here inside VinSim, which we'll see how to do here in a second, the formula for deaths would be the bacteria times the death rate. Now, so in order for me to calculate the number of deaths per unit time, I need to know the number of bacteria and the death rate. So these are two variables that I need in order to calculate this death's flow. So that's the reason why there has to be this arrow going forward that exports the back variable, the bacteria variable. And I need this arrow, arrow which exports the death rate. So I can write that as dr, I guess. Um, and but that, and I'll write this as back just so we're clear that I'm just shortening the variables that are here. And so this exports dr to deaths and this exports back to deaths. Inside a formula, you are only allowed to use variables that show up as links into the variable. Inside a deaths formula, I can't use births because births has not been exported to it. I can't use birth rate. I can't use average time reproduction. I can only use bacteria and death rate. And that's, so those are the only ones I need. Same thing with births. The births here are going to be the bacteria times the birth rate. And that birth, and so I'll write BR for birth rate here to make it clear. And so because I need two variables to calculate births, then I need to export both of those variables so that they both are available at births. And that's what these links are doing. So putting sense? them, yeah, but um, putting them the other way, like, like my first um, thought was that they would go the other way. So like going from births to bacteria and deaths to bacteria, because both of those, the like the bacteria, the amount of bacteria we have would be the birth, births minus the deaths. Is that completely wrong? Well, the, um, the, you, there is, there are these implicit areas so that the births that here are um, the number of births you have at any instant of time are the number of bacteria times the birth rate. And so this is saying, what this is representing is what is the influence of bacteria on births, which is the reason it's going in that direction. There is an implicit arrow going in the other direction, which is implying that the births has a positive influence on the number of bacteria. If you have more births, then you will have more bacteria. If you have more deaths, then you will have less bacteria, which is why there's a negative link going back and a positive going forward. So the links we explicitly draw are the links showing how the stock influences future values of the flow. The hidden links that are kind of parallel to the flow here are just representing um, that the flow has an influence on the stock. But that's kind of already sort of depicted by uh, the, the flow uh, arrows themselves. And so we, we don't draw them in again. So we're only drawing in the things that show that, they're, that the formulas inside the flows need information from the stock. 
And we kind of take for granted that the stock um, is going to be affected by the flows. I don't know if that helps. Okay, that Does that make sense. sense? Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Why is the influence, uh, this is in the chat, why is the influence on birth rate from average time of reproduction uh, negative? Excellent question. So average time of reproduction, that was the W. Birth rate, we wrote as one over W. And so it's the same logic as we did over here. If you increase the average time to reproduction, you're going to decrease the birth rate because it's got a, a reciprocal relationship. So, um, and that kind of makes sense. If you take longer until your next reproduction, then your reproductions per minute is going to be smaller. Does that make sense? Great. Any other questions about this? Good. Good. I'm thinking, yeah. So, yeah, always, anybody, it just goes to show if, if anybody has a question, I'm sure someone else has a question. I probably had that question when I started learning this material too. So, um, don't be shy. If, um, and if you are shy, then don't forget you can also use that, uh, that questions link um, at uh, bit.ly.212 um, questions, um, which you can post anonymously. And I will do my best to watch that. And I'm going to head over there now to make sure. There are no questions there. All right, so um, another quick example here. So uh, this target water level has a positive influence on tank gap. The water level itself has a negative influence on tank gap. Tank gap has a positive influence on water level. So I look at all of this and I should see that this is a, uh, that you know, well, I'd say, well, how do I know this is what type of feedback loop? Well, I have to remember that there is an implicit positive link here. So inflows have implicit positive links to the stocks that they're connected to. And that completes this circle here so that I can see that this is a balancing feedback loop. So this is a B or a negative feedback loop. And so um, that's all I'm depicting here is that there is an implicit positive link here, which is this link right here. And once I include it, then I get the full circle, which exposes that I've modeled a balancing feedback loop with this stock and flow diagram. All right, so questions on that? Great, great, all right. So um, five minutes, so let's, at least in VinSim, uh, take a quick look at how to do this. And um, by the way, uh, there is, so there is a, a homework where you're going to redo the toilet tank that you've already done using VinSim. Um, and so the, so we're running short on time here. So I'm probably gonna be rushed and I'm, this is gonna be terrible. Um, and I'm sure in your muddiest points this week, you're gonna say that was really rushed, uh, but, Fortunately, I do have a video tutorial I've already posted where I'm not rushed, which you can go to Canvas on both VinSim and Insight Maker that you can look under the Unit D module, you can find it there, which will give you a quick tutorial on how to do the stuff in VinSim. So we've already used VinSim for, uh, for this stuff. Now we're gonna expose a couple of other variables that are a couple of other options here in VinSim, like the level. So um, I can go into here in VinSim, and instead of using variable like before, I can click on uh, level and I can type in bacteria. And if that's a little small, then I'm gonna go in here, I'll right click, I'll bring my defaults over and I'm going to make this bigger, say 20 point font. And then um, I need to start drawing flows. And so um, that rate in VinSim is how you end up drawing flows. And so I click um, where I want the arrow to start and I, I click on where I want it to terminate. And then I can say births and I'll do the same thing with rate, but now I'm gonna do the deaths. And so I'm gonna click on rate here. I'll click where I want it to start. In this case, I wanna start on bacteria and I'm going to have it end off um, just out in the vacuum. 
And that's kind of what these little clouds mean here is that there's no stocks connected to the other end of it. So it's only affecting one stock. And so, um, so then uh, just um, I can create variables for my converters. And so I can say like create a lifetime or average lifetime. I can create a birth rate and I can create a um, average time to reproduction and a death rate. And I've put them in the wrong spot. So I'll put this one over here and the average lifetime over here. And so, so far we haven't really done much different than what you've done before, uh, except now we're using the rate and the box variable or the level up here. So I then do the connections like you've done before. I know that average time to reproduction affects birth rate. I know the birth rate affects births. I know the bacteria affects births. So all the stuff that we've done before, let's see if I can manage to get that arrow drawn properly. There we go. Maybe I'll do it down here just to be different. And then I'll draw another arrow from bacteria to deaths. Death rate affects deaths and average lifetime affects death rate. Okay, so, so far, nothing really that different. If I wanted to, I could annotate this whole thing and all the links just like I would in a causal loop diagram. What I'm gonna do um, instead is I'm gonna click on this equations and anything that shows up highlighted in black means that an equation is missing. So um, I go into each one of these things and I can click or uh, click on them once and it brings up a new dialogue we haven't seen before. It's this big uh, ugly panel here. And for um, most of these things, we're not gonna worry about using for a while, but for the equations here, I just clicked on average time to reproduction. This is where you end up putting, all right, I say, well, 0.75, this is where you end up putting the number that was W in our Excel spreadsheet. If I go over to average lifetime, then I put my uh, three, which is like the, the L in the uh, spreadsheet. When I click on birth rate for this equation, then um, it shows me um, under the equations here, a bunch of variables that I've already, I'm um, oh, sorry, down here, it shows me all of the variables I'm allowed to use based on the links that I've drawn. And so I can do one divided by, and then click on this variable, average time to reproduction. And that's like typing in Excel, one divided by a cell name. But now I don't use a cell name, I actually use the variable name. If I go down into births, likewise, it shows me bacteria and birth rate. So I can just say bacteria times birth rate. If I go to deaths, I can say bacteria times death rate. And then I'll quickly put in a death rate and I will show you how to set the initial condition on the stock here. So, so far these formulas that I just went through here and I know it was fast, but again, there's a tutorial online under unit uh, D. So down here, the unit D module where I go much more slowly through this. So then the last thing I need to do is when I click on this stock, I never adjust the stock formulas, never. But under initial value, I put my initial number of bacteria, which I'll put one, which was like the first line of the spreadsheet. So I have just built a simulation model. And so um, if I want to, I can run this simulation model by hitting the little play guy up here and it will run but nothing will happen. It just generates data that you don't see. In order for me to actually generate a plot, then I can click um, on a variable or a set of variables. So I can click on say bacteria and births. And then I can go over to graph and it will generate a graph like this one. And this graph shows me um, they're a little hard to see in the fonts here, but there are two lines, a red line and a blue line. And down here in the legend, I see the blue line are my bacteria exploding to infinity. 
and the red line are my number of births, which are also exploding to infinity. And so that's a quick example of how we can run these simulations and graph outputs from them. Now, um, next time I will do a similar demo in Insight Maker, but again, there is a video already online there. So for now, since I've held you uh, uh, late, um, I will uh, jump to the end here. Just a reminder, there is an assignment um, that where you're basically going to redo the toilet tank assignment, but using Vincent. And, um, and so give a shot at that. Uh, it's a real short assignment um, and you know, it'll feel like you've already done it because you really already have and it'll be easier in Vincent. Um, and so let's put up the attendance question. If I can find it, which there. So the last attendance exercise, same URL. And uh, the question I guess that I'll ask is, um, uh, we have, there are three types of elements in a stock and flow diagram, stocks, flows, and what else? So what is the third thing that are sort of like the helper? Uh, and there are several names for these, but these are the helpers that you don't necessarily need, but you, um, they really help you in making your stock and flow diagram clean. So that's all I've got for you today. I'm sorry to hold you kind of over. Um, I will pick up where we left off on Thursday, but you should have enough uh, between that and the videos to give a shot at the simulation of the toilet tank in VinSim, which will be even smaller than the simulation that I just ran for the bacterial tank or for the toilet tank. And thanks for your patience. Thank you. Is there, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stick around. Otherwise, feel free to take off. We have the perusal due Thursday, right? That's right. And there is a reading assignment uh, due Thursday on uh, Moorcroft's chapter where he goes over the same stuff we've been talking about. OK, thanks. Sorry, I, I knew that. I just further clarification. All right, thank you so much for showing us Dexter as well. That was awesome. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing because I understand this is like really a weird time with COVID and everything. So thanks again. Thanks for that. And, and likewise, thanks for your guys' patience. It's weird for you too. Bye, thank you.